Okay. Um, we are still looking at Philippians. Christoph has been talking about Philippians and the reality of biblical joy. And we're going to just briefly um, recap on what he said last week, bring out a few important things. But before we do that, I just want to do something interesting. Uh, it's not going to change our lives. Just a little bit of history of Philippi or the book of Philippians. And, um, and, and when you get a glimpse of the book or what was happening, you kind of get a bigger picture of who God is and how he's operating, similar to what Ora said this morning. There is a, such a beautiful picture, and you see it throughout the word. And uh, just something interesting of the book of Philippians. It was um, northern Greece, or in that time, Macedonia, northern Macedonia. And it was uh, Phil Philippi was the first town where, where Paul established his church or established a church but it actually started with a group of of or a, a little prayer group two women and that's where it started and philippi was an extremely strategic town according to god so philippi thessalonica neapolis was all northern macedonia or now what we know is greece northern greece and against there there was this mountain range and on the other side of the mountain range there was europe but the only way through to europe was through Philippi. And, um, and later Paul called this the colony of heaven. He called the city or the town of Philippi the colony of heaven. And rightly so, because from there, the gospel spread to Europe. And it, from this little prayer group with two women and Paul, it spread throughout Europe. And it's beautiful. And so Paul was where he was down a little bit more south, and he was venturing up out of obedience, wanted to go to Asia, and the Lord said, no, no, no. Go, keep going, keep going, keep going. Go past the towns, don't stop, keep going. And he ended up in Philippi where he met these two women, started a prayer group, and from there it became a colony of heaven. Beautiful, very strategic, very, very strong on the Lord's heart. He had a plan, and from there it spread like wildfire. Just something interesting with regards to the book of Philippians. Um, Christoph shared that joy or biblical joy is an emotion that we experience. It's something that is real, emotional experience, and that it is only produced from the Spirit. This biblical joy can only be produced as a result of having the Spirit within us. It is a fruit of the Spirit. And yes, um, we experience joy in the lack of things also, the special times with our family, catching an incredible big fish, uh, cutting through an incredible steak, and all these things that create a bit of a joy. It's good, and it's yes. And it is there. But the Lord is saying somewhere, somehow, we can experience an incredible joy through the toughest of circumstances also. Whether it is prison, cancer, death, tough circumstances within our family. There's a biblical joy, an emotion that is within us that is good, that is pleasing, that is pleasant, that can be experienced. And we see it very clearly in the book of Philippians through Paul. When in a Roman prison and... If you go look at a bit of history, prisons in Rome that day, that was that was harsh. And somehow this guy was saying, this is okay. I'm experiencing an incredible amount of joy. I think for myself, who die die oude drag? It's only produced by the fruit of the Spirit. There's no other way. He had no outside circumstances to well up and make him happy and experience this joy. It was simply as a result of his eyes fixed on Jesus, knowing that there is a bigger picture and that there is eternity, eternity that lays ahead of him. So it's a thing that is produced by the Spirit. Um, not influenced by outside circumstances. And um, one thing that he also said, it is, a, it is not a, a, a trying to be happy, this fake joy suppressing kind of the realities and the circumstances, trying to put our head in the ground like an ostrich and forget about everything that's around us. It is, joy is the helper that is navigating us through these things, maturely. And when we do that with joy, there is always a, there is always a result. There is always a light. There is always salt. There is always a fragrance in this world that stinks. And so these are some of the things that Christoph touched on last week. Another one in Revelations 22 um, spoke to me deeply where it says, The Spirit and the bride say, come. And the one who hears this, 
He says, come to. Let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life, let him take it. And Christoph mentioned that um, there's some sort of natural response within a being. When you experience something incredible, you want to share it. Now, we've gone to many campsites, and when we get to a campsite that is, yeah, you immediately go and tell your friend, yes, you listen, you must go and camp where it's outstanding, the price is good, the school and the ability is amazing. And somehow you just want to share an experience that is good. Christoph shared about the ice cream at Spar or what the cult is, but it's a natural response to want to share what you experience as good. And so I, with regards to the scripture, if the spirit and the bride say, come, and somehow I, as an individual, have heard that and have come and have experienced Jesus as my treasure, discut, and experienced the fruit of joy, peace, and it's good, then automatically, naturally, I will want to share it. And I remember in my beginning days of being reborn, I was by a passiful, very passionate, a bit volatile, but there was something new within me that said, yeah, I need people to experience what I'm experiencing. But then the question is, if we don't have that desire for others who are thirsting to come, if we have got no desire within our being, within our heart, to see others experience this, what is the problem? And if possibly we are reborn, and we are living in this world, and we are not experiencing this biblical joy that we see in Paul's life, where is the problem? And so I was challenged with this um, because I am a reborn believer. And there's, there's definitely times where I've got zero desire for anyone who is thirsty, hungry for the Lord, for good life with Him and eternity. Ach, what? Now, what is the issue? And uh, God kind of just took me through a couple of scriptures with regards to this. And lastly, the one thing that and Christoph mentioned before we dig into the new scriptures is... Um, that this biblical joy, regardless of circumstances, is truly a desire of God for us. He wants it. Obedience to Him, it shouldn't be a, oh, okay, there's a beautiful joy that comes with obedience, and that's God's desire. It's not a lust. It's not a, ah, oh, yeah, okay, I will, whatever. It's His desire for us to be filled with this beautiful joy in our everyday, day to day. And I was challenged, and I, I went um, through, a, through a couple of scriptures, and I, I asked myself, I looked around me, and I said, but okay, I know two types. There is people that is not reborn, and if this fruit, joy, is a, spirit, uh, is a fruit of the Spirit, then for sure it cannot be experienced. It would be impossible if I was not reborn and have the Spirit within me. There is no way for me to experience this beautiful biblical joy. But the second is, what if I am? What if I am reborn? What if I have given my life over? What if I have been baptized and walked long years or whatever the case may be and, and struggling with this somewhere, somehow? Is there something that I need to look at? Is there something that I need to address? And please hear me very clearly. Um, this is not a works thing, but it's an acknowledging thing. There's not a works that can well up joy. It's not a works, something that I can do that can all of a sudden, okay, I'm alive again in the Lord. I feel this compassion towards others. I experience this beautiful biblical joy. It's not a works thing, but it's more of an acknowledgement thing of where I am in this relationship? Where am I in the midst of this journey? And if it's a spirit thing that is producing this fruit, and if it's not there, then we need to look at it spiritually. So there's four scriptures that I want to raise out here. Um, John 3, 1 to 8. I'm going to name them, some, all four of them. You can write it down or get there. John 3, 1 to 8. Titus 3, verse 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 19, and Ephesians 4, verse 30. And I think what we want to do here is somehow create a platform for us to go out 
and to work within the cell groups with my mentor, with my family, and identify and chat about it and talk about it and pray about it. Is there something that we need to be looking at that could possibly be keeping this joy, this way of Paul, a reality in our lives? Because if I'm seeing in something in Paul, I, I, I desire this. Because I go through circumstances all year round that is not pleasant and great and not pleasant and terrible. And we will continue to live like this in this world until we are done here. So somehow I long to live with this biblical mature joy that we see in Philippians. And so I want to be free of whatever it is that may be keeping me back from that or maybe suppressing that for whatever reason. And the scriptures make some of that very clear. So these are a few things that I've identified in scripture. But again, let us go to our cell groups. Let us chat about it in our families. Let us speak to it with our mentors and let us take it further and pray with one another in this and be real and be serious. So um, the first two scriptures, John 3 and Titus 3, is uh, something that we may have or most of us possibly, I'm not sure where we are at, has experienced already, but it needs to be mentioned. We cannot assume that all is reborn. And if we are reborn, then so be it. It's good. We will look at the other two scriptures with regarding to if we are reborn, what is the issue? John 3, um, verse 1, it says, Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Teacher, we know that you're a teacher that has come from God. For no one could perform the signs that you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom, experience the kingdom, the fruit of the kingdom, unless they are born again. How can someone be born again when they are old? Nicodemus asked, Surely they cannot enter, the second, enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So is it with everyone born of the Spirit. So maybe this is not applicable to me or to most of us here, but it needs to be mentioned. Being born again is the only way we're going to experience the fruit of the Spirit. And if we are uncertain about that, then we need to ask ourselves and we need to respond. Titus 3 says, At one time you were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by His Holy Spirit. So just before I go on to the things as a reborn believer, this needs to be mentioned. Because we're going to be dealing with people that might not be reborn. Don't know where we are at at the moment, but we cannot lay a burden of biblical joy on someone that doesn't have His Spirit. We have to start there. It is only the spirit that produces the joy that we are seeing in Paul's life and that we are longing for as a congregation within a world that is demakar, where we need joy. Okay, so this is where it starts. And, and I really want to be bold here. If, if you're unsure that you're born again and uncertain that you have given your life over to the Lord, please go to a mentor. See someone here within the congregation. Come and say, I'm not sure. And, and let's be sure that you are sure, because if you've got some sort of desire, then this is where it starts. It's being born again. But with the other two scriptures, 1 Thessalonians, this is more in, in line with um, those that are born again, those that are walking with the Lord, but somehow, for some reason, is not experiencing this biblical joy at all times. And that's, uh, you know... I'm thinking, what is that even possible? Pro possibly not. Possibly it is. And if I start talking like that, then there's a problem already. Then I'm already lying on myself 
It is a fruit of the Spirit, not a fruit of bread for you and what I can do. And what circumstances I can create to well up some sort of joy. I need to surrender. I need to rest in the Lord. And it doesn't make sense. Peace that surpasses all understanding is a thing that doesn't make sense. It's in circumstances that is, this, I shouldn't experience peace here, but you do. And that is a fruit of the Spirit. So, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 19. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. And then this is the part that we're going to be looking at. Do not quench the Spirit. In Ephesians 4 verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. And we're going to look at these two aspects. Quenching the Spirit and grieving the Spirit. Now the definition of grieve, to feel an intense sorrow. In Afrikaans, bedroef. Of hartseer, if I understand correctly. Bedroef. So how is it possible that me, this feeble little being, can create an intense sorrow within the Holy Spirit? Quench, the definition of quench, um, that is to extinguish, to put out. And I saw in the Afrikaans translation, to bless. Or me fear to bless. Now, I remember when I stayed in Zambia for a time, there was a fire season every August. And whether it was 4 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock in the morning, when a fire broke out, you had to run. And it's hard work. But that's just a picture that I get of bliss, putting out intense effort to try and do something different rather than allow the fire to have its way. And um, how are we, as reborn believers, quenching and grieving the Spirit? And I believe this is an aspect that we can look at to deal with and to acknowledge so that the Spirit can bear the fruit that He longs and He desires to bear within our lives. So that we can walk as Paul in the midst of Cyrus, Koa Bockefeld, our work areas, our circumstances. Because only He can produce it. So I've, I've written a few things down out of Scripture. A few ways that I, as a reborn believer, can quench or grieve the Spirit. And it, and, it, and it opened my eyes a little bit, or it gave me a fresh reminder that I do have a responsibility here. Yes, it is Him that produces the fruit. It is Him who has His way. It is Him who is going to lead, guide, and show. But somehow in the midst of this, I've got a responsibility. And it's not got to do with works. It's got to do with intimacy, closeness, listening, responding. And then also being careful of the world. All throughout the world, we are see, ach, the word, we are seeing this. So I've got a couple of points, and again, this is only just a few. But in our cell groups, with your mentor, with your family, let us trust the Lord. Let us ask Him, in which way are we grieving, you and your spirit? In which way are we quenching, suppressing, extinguishing your spirit? So that we can stop or that we can acknowledge and realize and stand back and say, okay, have your way. Produce this fruit that you want to see, that you long for your people. So number one, and Christoph touched on this last week, it's the lies that we are believing. There is half-truths that has found its way into congregations in the worldwide church that we as a, as a believer are believing. Lies that we are believing. And we need to identify these lies, acknowledge them for what they are. We need to deal with them, look at them in the face, and repent. And some of the lies that he mentioned was, I'm not good enough. Or, no, 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 it's the pastor's job to lead the people and to show who Jesus Christ is and to raise them up and see that they are walking maturely with God. It's the pastor's job. It's not mine. It's his job. That is a lie according to what we see in the Word. 
Another lie that he said, and he, I'm just quoting what he said, and we've seen this saying, I've seen it everywhere. And at a time I thought, yeah, this is, this is true. You know, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. We don't see that here in the word. Yes, we need to have a beautiful, uh, I say a beautiful lifestyle. We need to have a godly lifestyle that expresses for sure. That is a testimony of this word for sure. We do, but that is a half truth. The full truth according to this word is that we need to testify. We need to speak of. We need to share who is Jesus Christ. What has he done in my life? How does he want, long for you as a body? We need to testify. So this half truth, and it, and it creates a passivity. I just need to have a great lifestyle. Then I'm good. Sorted. Don't have to say nothing to no one about this Jesus. They must just see. And hopefully understand all this word. No. We need to teach. We need to share. We need to walk with and prepare and raise up. It is a responsibility. So these lies that we are believing. I believe that the enemy has come in. And as a result of these lies and believing them subtly. It is quenching his spirit. His spirit is not having his way. And please hear me right. It is nowhere. No, and and. And the Lord is still sovereign. It is not that we can be in a position that, okay, what I'm doing is just going to put God now under this blanket. No. But for some reason, he's given us a free will. And as a result of that, we can say, we don't want you to have your way. Or we want you to have your way. He's still sovereign regardless. But he's given us a free will. We need to just, I need to remind myself of that, that, what I'm doing or not doing is not determining who God is here. He is still sovereign. And he will continue to be sovereign. But as a result of this free will, I've got a choice. I've got a way that I can suppress. I can quench. I can grieve. And we need to be careful of that. So believing lies. And go home. Ask the Lord, what are the lies that we as a family are believing? That we as a congregation are believing? That I am as an individual believing? Write them down. Because these are some of the lies that is quenching and grieving the spirit. Where he cannot have his way and produce the fruit that we long for and that this world needs. Number two is, um, it comes out of Philippians verse 2. Or Philippians 2 verse 12, sorry. Do everything without grumbling and arguing. So that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. Oh, Irene is muy luck. Do everything without grumbling and moaning. Negativity and bitterness. Work, situations, circumstances, people that we work with. Places that we find ourselves with. How often am I moaning? How often am I negative? Grumbling? Complaining? Is my place where I'm at, whether it's my home, my work, my family, is it a place of worship? Or is it a place of grumbling? And when I mean worship, I don't mean a song. And singing out, I mean acknowledging God for who He is regardless of circumstances. That is true worship. Acknowledging God for who He is regardless of circumstances. Is it a place of worship? Or am I moaning? Am I grumbling? Am I arguing? Constantly. And if we are, then we are suppressing. We are grieving and we are quenching the spirit. We need to stop it. The other one comes from Ephesians 4.29. So we read Ephesians 4.30 and that is, do not quench the spirit. And just before that, it talks about, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up the one in need and bringing grace to those that listen. These things are very practical. It's not difficult to understand. I've been in many conversations, myself included, where there's unwholesome talk. There's no building up. And when we do that, we are grieving the spirit. 
this intense sorrow, bedroof. The Spirit is experiencing this. And we need to stop it. Then number four, and I use a, a medical term here, multiple sclerosis. Um, is there any doctors in here? Because I might be wrong with trying to explain what this is. But I think the congregation, the church worldwide, struggles with multiple sclerosis. Now, multiple sclerosis in medical terms is, um, let me read it, because I'm no doctor. Resulting nerve damage disrupts communication between the brain or head and the body. Multiple sclerosis cause many different symptoms, including vision loss, pain fatigue, impaired coordination. So somehow, we as the body have got a head, and his name is Jesus Christ. He knows exactly what needs to happen. And we as the body have got our own agenda. We've got our own plan. We've got our own desires and response. And we are not connected. There's a, there's a nerve problem here when listening and responding. And we don't. It's like, if you, if you look at this body, it's incredible. I can, in my head, say, one. And it was there before I even said one. And so there's this immediate obedience with this and the body. But when multiple sclerosis is a reality, and, and it's a really harsh disease, it's really real, there's this communication problem where your body is not responding to what the head is saying. And this is only out of deep, intimate relationship with our Creator. Consistent time with Him. Desiring to hear His voice. Asking for grace upon grace that will enable us to respond. Multiple sclerosis within the wider church is a reality. And when there's no response, when there's a slow response or a no response or an own agenda response, we are quenching the Spirit. We are grieving Him. And it's not good. And we see many examples of that in the Word. Saul was one of them. He was this uh, a really strong king when he started. Later on, he became powerful and demacar and jealous. And, uh, but there was a situation there where he had to wait for Samuel to bring the plan for battle. And Saul was getting a little bit agitated because Samuel was taking his time. But now in the Old Testament, that was a, a very clear symbol of you know, someone that knew the Lord who brought the message. But we're in this day that we can wait on the Lord ourselves and hear what he's saying and respond. And as a result, Saul got agitated and he didn't want to wait on the Lord. He made his own plan. What was the result? Destruction. He did not wait on the Lord. There was no connection between the head and the body. Multiple sclerosis. It's really, a, it's really a strong point on my heart for the wider church is that we would learn and desire to hear God and respond regardless of who we are. Whether young, old, working or not, we're all in a position to respond and be connected with the head. And then see his plans unfold, whoever we are. Um, number five, keeping things behind closed doors or in the dark, whether it is hurt, sin, unforgiveness, church politics that hasn't been dealt with, family matters, basically things that, that, that is here. And is causing distress, causing anxiousness, causing bitterness. Not dealt with, not dealt with, but also not brought into the open and dealt with. And this is something that we've heard a million times probably. But it is continuing to be real. It is a continual process because we're in a world that hurts. We're in a world that struggles. We're in a world that is constantly, consistently trying to bring hurt, division, pain, brokenness. And we will always experience this. Sorry. We will always experience this. And if it is kept here, if it is not dealt with, we are suppressing the Spirit. We are quenching the Spirit. We are grieving Him. And then uh, the last one, and it's not the last one. This is just a few. We know now that we're going to go pray about it and we're going to talk about it in our cells and we're going to go look at this. But one of them is... Um, not loving others the way that we love ourselves. Now, I've been chewing through this for a couple of weeks now and struggling with it because I really realize that I love myself, and it's a good thing. 
is not a bad thing because the Lord is saying love others the way that you love yourself. So loving yourself clearly in this is not a bad thing. But I spend so much time on loving myself, serving, so it can be easier. And I like practical. I enjoy making things practical. It must work. So I spend a lot of time in making my home, the vehicle, whatever it is that I'm involved with. I spend a lot of time. And it's as a result of loving myself. Because I want it to be easier. I want it to be more practical. I want to build my family up. And this is great. This is good stuff. Please don't hear me wrong. We need to do this. But according to the word, we need to love others the same way we are loving ourselves. Now, I spend a lot of time on myself. I spend a lot of capacity on myself. I spend a lot of effort thinking, scrolling, looking, desiring, wanting on myself. Great. It's not a problem. But is it? The same with others around us. Are we loving others around us, serving others around us the same way that I'm doing it for myself? And if we are not, we are quenching the spirit. And this is a challenge. So I'm thinking, Jesse, okay, how do I do this practically? I don't know. Lord, help me. Help me, Lord. Please, friend, can you pray with me? This is a desire. Cell group, this is what's on my heart. Help me. Pray. Lord, help me. It's not a thing that we can figure out. It's something that the Spirit produces. We need to know that. In ourself, we cannot. It's a fruit of the Spirit to love our neighbor the way that we love ourselves. It's very straightforward. And there is more. There is many more. And, and all that I want to do is create this platform. Let us go out. Let us ask one another. How are we grieving and quenching the Spirit? And the only way to respond to this is not to become better Christians, but is to repent. Is to acknowledge where I'm falling short, acknowledge how I'm grieving the Spirit, acknowledge where I'm being so entangled, and repent. And repent, in other words, of belay, in other words, acknowledge and realize that I need God and I need His cross finished. I need God and I need his cross. And John said it, repent, the kingdom is near. If you want to experience of anything of the kingdom, repent. It's a beautiful thing and please hear my heart, this is not a you're a sinner, doom sermon. This is a beautiful invitation where the fruit of the spirit can be experienced, where this intimacy between me and God can be a real reality. And for those that have it, it's good. Let us continue in that. And there's a scripture that I just want to quickly, it wasn't on here, but just encourage us with, and it's in line with um, that Revelations 22. I read it for the little children there at the school, um, and it's just popped up in my heart again. Um, the God of all comfort. 2 Corinthians 1, uh, from verse 3, it says, praise, to be, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion. And the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the very same comfort that he comforted us. With the very same comfort that I've been comforted by my creator, I can go and comfort others. So where, where, wherever we are at the moment, whether it is not reborn, we have a responsibility to respond. If we are reborn and we do have the spirit, are we grieving and quenching where we cannot experience and not allow him to produce that full fruit that we see throughout his word? And if we are and we are running this race and it's good, well then let us comfort the way, the same way that we have been comforted over time in all our troubles. And so there's, there's, there is no escape in this. <laughs> it is a beautiful invitation. Wherever we are at, and when we are invited and we respond, there is light, there is salt, there is fragrance, there is joy, there is perseverance, and then obviously there is, listen, you need to taste this. Come and taste this. It's good. 
You know, when there's a butcher in town and you get the best meat and that, I, I enjoy meat and steak. And when there is a good, and you cut, you just know that and you will tell all your friends about it. Oh, this is a good steak there. And it's the same. It's a natural response. And if we've got no desire to invite people to come, we need to ask ourselves the question, what is it? What is it? So I really pray that we will, in our week, um, really be encouraged to sit with, to talk through, to identify, to acknowledge with the people that is close, mentors, cell groups, family, the lies that we are believing and the ways that we are quenching and grieving the Holy Spirit. And I want to leave us with this scripture um, in Hebrews 12, verse 1. Lees net voor ek garments is my baie snaaks where They are very clever. They, they know when you're stressing. I was sitting down there and I said, listen, take it easy. Just take a breath. Your stress levels are high at the moment. And I said it over from home. So, dinge, ons hoef nie nou ons self te dankie. Ons oorloosies kan ook, as hy, as hy. I'm going to leave us with this last, last scripture and then, um, and then we're going to have communion. And uh, let us have communion with the cross in mind. That we can really come. Not with any sort of plan or good works, but just an acknowledgement of where we're at, of who God is, and that we need Him. Hebrews 12 verse 1 to 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. There's a race that is marked out for us, but there's also sin and things that can hinder us that so easily entangles. Let us throw it off. And let us, sorry, no. And then it says, and let us run this race with perseverance marked, fixing our eyes on Jesus. This was Paul's secret in a Rome prison that was ridiculously harsh circumstances, experiencing an incredible amount of joy that made no sense to anyone around him. What was his secret? Fixing my eyes on Jesus. And having his spirit to produce what he wants to produce. And being the body without multiple sclerosis to respond. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. We don't have to well up this faith. He's the pioneer of it. He's the perfecter of it. We need to fix our eyes on him. He will do it. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. For the joy set before him, what was that joy set before him? The cross. What was the reason for the cross? Us with him. Nothing else. His bride. His wife. He has an opportunity that I can get my wife back. She can be saved. The joy set before him. Are we experiencing that same joy for those around us that hasn't been invited yet? Are we experiencing that joy that he has, that he wants to produce, to be with him, and everything that it entails, the king and his kingdom? We need to ask help for that. And we need to explore this so that, so that it can become a reality. Not by good works, but just by acknowledging. So I encourage you, go out here. Sit with people that you know that love the Lord and speak about it. Speak about the lies that we are believing. And look at the areas where we are grieving and quenching the spirit so that we can be the Pauls in this world because it really needs it. It really, really needs it. Wait a deal.
Ja, ik denk Breedse Gaumen heeft um, mijn stresslevels opgeteld. Um, <laughs> ik zit voor ochtend hier zo en ik denk aan iets, die heren wijst van mij iets. En ik denk, nee, man, het is, het is te eenvoudig. Um, en, hoe, en hoe langer breed preek, hoe meer kom ik achter. Ik is hier multiple sclerosis. Ik is hier passief ook. Die heren wil niet met, hij, hij wil ook met iemand anders ook hier praten, maar hij praat met mij. In de zo so eenvoudige historie, um, mijn kleinkinders kom gisteren naar ons toe. En zo so die die dag het hulle nou al zeven keer met hulle oma gepraat op die telefoon en klein Anna is nou jaren en een half oud. En haar ma sê van, hy by die vierde oproep te begin sy heel saam, nou hoor ek hoe praat aan die met hulle en Anna sê wat gaan aan, sê sê nie, sy het nou al vier keer vandag geval. Sy val net aan mekaar vandag. En so kom keier hulle by ons en sy is heel vriendelijk en sy sit op die bank en sy begin speel op die bank en sy leen hand op die kussing en sy skop haat in die ruglening weg en daar glij sy oor die kant van die bank, op haar kop. Boe op die kussing en is net bene in die licht en naderhand val sy oor en haar hart breek, haar hart breek en dis die vijfde keer, as ek kan nie tel nie, maar dis nou baie. En per die keer voel ek ook so, dat ek val niet aan mekaar. En Sy huil verskrikkelijk en haar maat roos haar en haar oma roos haar en sy hou gege op. Nou sit sy daar, maar jy kan sien haar opgewondenheid vir die lewe is so'n bykie weg. En haar maat sê vir, haar boetie vraag, Kala, klein Kala vraag, wat is fout met haar? En Marisa sê, sy is net een bykie broos. Sal dit help as Kala vir jou een drukkie gee? Vraag sy vir klein Anna. Anna sê ja. Sy sê vir Kala, Sal jy bereid wees om vader drukkie te gee? Hy sê, ja, hy sal. En hy staan op en hy kom so na toe aangestap en toe hy so meter van haar af is, toe stop hy. En hy kyk haar so, hy sê vir Marisa, maak het eerst die skoon. <laughs> en vir ochend toe ek hier sit, toe het lik ek maar, dit is betek hier hoe ek met ander mense maak, wat die druk nodig het. Die heren wil dier my werk. En dan sê ek, ma, mm, mag het eerst die skoon. Of per die keer het ek druk nodig. En dan voel ek, ma, nee, ek kan, eh, mm, nee, ek kan nie. Ek kan nie dit van die heren verwacht. Nie. En ek het verochend hier gesit en sê, heren, ek het multiple sclerosis en ek word die pen daarvan. En as hier iemand is vir ochend wat, wat die druk van u af nodig het, laat hy weet, hy kan maar kom, met die breakfast op hom, met wat ook al in ons vastlou, met die vlekke. En as ons vandag nachtmal gebruik, laat ons het weet. Die, die, die heren sê nie, uh-uh, moet nie, jy het, het goed op jou. Hy sê vir ons kom, Ek het vir jou druk. Ek soek juist die vlekke. Hm. Amen. Dankie. So we can um, hand out the uh, the communion. Ek wil hier nou verder praat oor die communion. Ek denk dit is nou genoeg. Ons verstaan Godse hart. We understand God's heart. Um, and let's let us respond while taking communion to these areas that have possibly convicted, raised up uh, with the heart of coming to the Lord, just coming, acknowledging. Thank you. Is het haar liekie of iets hier daarachter? As, lekker, jy kan sommer aansit, so bykie sachies. Ek gaan net afsluit in gebed vir ons. I'm just gonna close in prayer for us. Um, eindelijk op my hart, Niels, kan jy vir ons afsluit in gebed? Is het reg asjeblief? And um, when we finish, just in your own time, 
Let us be soaked by the worship and stand before God with communion, with our eyes on the cross, the finished work of the cross, His body, His blood that is cleansed. And let us come. And in your own time, take your communion. And, um, and that's us. Thank you very much. <laughs>